And I'm Dr. Adam Jirachi. And you are listening to Love's a Secret Weapon podcast. Chapter 20, Eloquent, Part 4. We hold these truths to be self-evident.
my mind and my intuition and my spirit just kept opening, especially with my great-grandmother's vision, as well as when I discovered the designer Madeline VNA. I would read Vogue or Elle and see if I could find her mentioned. I realized that if I went to the very small editorials, someone like John Galliano at the time from Dior would talk about Madeline VNA. From my reading, I discovered that she was sort of big in stature, unlike Coco Chanel, who could wear all of the clothes that she designed. VNA didn't work with a realistic muse or a mannequin. She used miniatures. Then she invented a sewing machine that would sew on the bias. I bought a book to learn more about her, and the book really taught me about assembling clothing on a bias cut. There's a lot of trial and error to this process, and my seamstresses were challenged, not only with the hand stitching, but making sure the silk lay still and joined a seam on a bias cut, and then running it through my vintage machine. In some cases, we resorted to hand stitching the seams to make sure everything lay the way it was supposed to. It was very old world and quite a beautiful experience. Madeline VNA kind of rose up out of the pages of the book and started guiding me in a certain way. There were no patterns that I could ever look at or any garments I could reference, but there was one illustration of a dress in this book that I showed to a pattern maker. She and I studied it and studied it and finally, we understood the architecture and could start making the pieces of the pattern. It became quite a project. On one of my trips to Los Angeles, I was turned on to a woman photographer named Tina Modotti, who was quite prominent in the 1930s. She lived in the world of Alfred Stieglitz and Frida Kahlo. One of her photographs called Platinum Rose made a very strong impression on me. I was compelled to interpret it onto silk. Because of the intricacy of the pattern as well as the amount of yardage that I would need, I called on the talents of Kalalani to execute this project. I needed five yards of fabric in one continuous piece. The ladies at Kalalani said this was a first. They took my silk and fastened one end to a sawhorse and across their long studio stretched the 15 feet of fabric to another sawhorse. To create the tension needed when applying paint, they needed to anchor the sawhorses more than usual. <laughs> Hand painting the platinum rose pattern took several days at an exorbitant cost of $1,200. All our fingers were crossed when the fabric was rolled into the steamer to set the dye. I thank my lucky stars this was a success. My next step was marrying a 30s designer with a 30s photographer, both strong women. What I ultimately discovered while I was making this dress, which was more like a gown, was that Madeleine Viena figured in the initial of her last name in all of her clothing. The V was always there. She didn't need a label. Her signature was the construction. I would estimate that design houses such as Lan Van and Balenciaga would give credit to V&A in their bias cut designs. Designing with the 30s in mind begs the question of how a woman previous to that era bound herself in uncomfortable foundation garments. Coco Chanel was responsible for allowing women to dress without whalebones sticking in their ribs and girdles cinching in their waists and hips. The delicate fabric that I was working with had a mind of its own. It really preferred au naturel. As an example, in my boutique downstairs, I initially kept my collection up as a prototype for clients to order from. One woman wanted a wedding dress made from a certain style that I had. This garment wouldn't require any painting and would be made from a heavier non-translucent silk, although it did require accepting a concept. She came for her first fitting wearing a Merry Widow bra and a sort of spandex-like girdle. She said that the dress wasn't really fitting right, so I asked if she would step into the bathroom, take off her undergarments, and just put the dress on solo. 
When she came out of the bathroom and stood in front of the mirror, she said, this is the way it should look. This is the way it fits me right. I asked if she would be comfortable this way without all of the foundation on, because now all she was wearing was her bikini underwear. She told me surprisingly, I'm very comfortable. I felt that this was a revelation for her to be more accepting of herself. And I could tell that this was probably the first time she would go out in public without the armor of undergarments. This blushing bride was glowing with pride as she continued to explain that she was going to be married on the beach barefoot and then took on the project of making her a veil, a billowy silk tool. A town nearby called Honaka'a had a fabulous shop with a gemstone collection for beading. I began studying chakra energy, which are energy centers in your body. I discovered that different areas of the body related to different colors that would enhance your energy. All the colors are significant. For instance, blue is associated with the throat chakra, which symbolizes the ability to express yourself. Wearing blue, especially having a gemstone, which is a crystal from the earth around your neck and possibly something long enough to touch your heart, enhances your ability to express yourself. I decided to incorporate custom buttons that were hand-beaded with gemstones. And one of my favorite applications for buttons was a hand-painted banana leaf shirt with peridot buttons that were a shade of apple green. This correlated to your heart chakra, and when wearing it, could remind you to open your heart. Everything is energy. I wonder if Chanel had the awareness when she chose the primary ingredient for Chanel number no. 5, which is jasmine. The jasmine that is used is sourced from the same field in Grasse, France. What I've discovered of late is that jasmine is an antidepressant. Did she realize that she uplifted her own spirits when she used this perfume on herself? It's no surprise that Chanel No. 5 is still the number one perfume in the world. And most people probably aren't aware that they're using a jasmine-based ingredient that helps with their mood. A curious mind my Jared has that led him to find a company that was looking for a fashion house to do fashion shows. In 1998, I was offered an opportunity to go to Florida. It was explained to me that I was required to bring 10 ensembles, which became the impetus for me to create my collection. My imagination ran wild. Not only was I embarking on an ambitious undertaking, making garments, but I also had to accessorize them. This is when I met a local hat maker through my business associate, Patty Cook. Every hat for each ensemble was hand-woven and could be secured with a custom hat pin that I had a local jeweler make. He also restrung strands of beads for necklaces, knotting each bead and then securing a clasp. To complete the ensembles, I designed a platform shoe in various colors to coordinate with each outfit. Some of them were beaded as well. I chose a Chanel satin pump that looked like a 30s tango shoe that complemented two of the dresses. My next concern was traveling with the collection. I decided to create garment bags made of silk organza. My fabric dealer told me that that was what was used in museums to store garments and protect them from mold and moths. Jared and I made the decision to call my line Adasa after my great-grandmother, I had custom hangers made with my label name on it, and I tied a black silk vintage ribbon at the top for each. Now all my girls could travel in style. I stuffed two trunks filled with everything and began the long journey from Hawaii to Florida. I unpacked my girls, ironed, and pressed all the wrinkles that they had acquired on their journey and started dressing my models. <laughs> all 10 ladies were lined up and ready to walk the runway outside when it started to rain. The promoter rushed over to me and apologized for the weather. It poured. While the models were still dressed, the promoter offered me an alternative. 
how would you like to come to Monte Carlo and do a fashion show on the Mediterranean? Gee, I thought he was going to direct me to do the fashion show indoors. I was stunned at the offer and looked at Jared to see his reaction, which was a thumbs up. In June 1998, Ivana Trump was being honored as Woman of the Year in Monte Carlo. Before we arrived in Monte Carlo, we landed in Nice. I hadn't been to France since my experience with the dating game. This time, I was with my beloved Jared and many trunks of handmade garments, as well as the custom line of shoes, jewelry, and hats for all the models. A Mercedes taxi pulled up and was filled with all the luggage and trunks. In caravan style, another Mercedes taxi drove Jared and me over the sandstone mountains to Monte Carlo. We checked into the same hotel that Ivana was staying in. At the time, she actually had her own line of clothing, and so she chose to wear one of her own garments. But she did choose one of the garments and matching shoes and necklace for her daughter, Ivanka, to wear. Ivanka looked absolutely exquisite in her rose quartz ensemble that I gifted to her. There we were at the edge of the Mediterranean Sea in an ancient setting of brick and stone. Ivana Trump, her boyfriend, daughter, and a multitude of European friends, including the one and only Gina Lola Brigida. I hadn't seen her since my days at Cinecitta in Rome. I just couldn't refrain from telling Ivana about the last time I saw her friend Gina. If you recall, I have described a photo on her piano when we met at her villa. There was a little boy naked bending over looking through to the camera that his beloved mother was taking a photo of him. Well, that little boy was all grown up now and standing by his mother's side 30 years later. Ivana's jaw dropped. It was time to start the music that I had prepared for the fashion show, which featured Portishead's Glory Box. I received some whistles and applause from my sensuous collection and felt very gratified that I was accepted by Ivana's peers who were among the old wealth of Europe. Before leaving Monte Carlo, the promoter invited us to be part of future fashion shows. Upon our return to Hawaii, we made some changes in our lifestyle by inviting a father and daughter to live with us. It was pretty cool because it turned out that she became one of my models. Jared and I had gone to an estate sale in Kohala. The owner had traveled all over Asia collecting artifacts from China and India, Indonesia, and Thailand. A kind man named Jimmy was her caretaker and lived in the house with his daughter, Leia, who was 14 at the time. He was looking for a new place to live and we struck up a friendship. We were in the process of building another garage with an apartment over it and told Jimmy and Leia that if they were interested, they could live there. Jimmy was a pro golfer who ended up coming to live in Hawaii where he became a landscaper. He always loved golf, though, and whenever he could, he'd be downplaying or teaching at the resort. Tragically, a year before, Leia's mother had died. Their daughter was tall and slim with Scandinavian features and the sweetest personality you can imagine. Even before the apartment was completed, they moved in and lived with the rest of whatever we had to do to make it completely livable. We set up a trade where all the work Jimmy did on our property as a gardener would be equal to rent. Leia's nymph-like body lent her perfectly to modeling. She was a natural clothes horse, collecting mostly second-hand. When I offered her the opportunity to model my couture, she jumped at the chance. By early November, I was offered to do a fashion show for an AIDS benefit held in Los Angeles. 
I invited Leia and Jimmy, as well as a local hula master, to join me in L.A. By the way, this was a first for all of them. The benefit was held at the House of Blues on Sunset Strip in front of 1,000 people. It was quite spectacular. Eric McCormick and Deborah Messing, the stars of Will and Grace, hosted the benefit and introduced the collection. The fashion show started with our young hula master performing a beautiful chant. We had hand-painted some hemp silk for his pareo, and we brought a lei from Hawaii that my friend told me would withstand the trip. The background music that I chose for my models was a song by R.E.M. called Lotus, which we looped. My son Joey had been playing drums for R.E.M. at the time, and he was the drummer on that song. We didn't announce this. It was just a personal thing. When the dust settled and we all came back to Hawaii, I started to look at my collection to see the reality of it. I was talking to my daughter, and we both decided that something was missing in the town of Waimea. That was a place to shop for ordinary things like jeans and t-shirts. And living in L.A. at the time, Katie was very aware of the fashion trends, and she turned me on to the hottest denim lines and James Purse, who was designing the trendiest t-shirts that would complement my collection. One of the small other spaces in our building opened up downstairs. We tried to rent this little cottage, but nobody took it. So we decided that maybe it was meant for us to open a little salon and put my collection in there. We decided we would keep the couture line in a special place in the salon, and we'd integrate other lines. Katie, who was 18 at the time, helped me in selecting some of the materials that I used to create this space. With Jared's business experience, I felt even more confident. It really became a family affair when his son, who lived on the island with us, joined us with his internet expertise and began designing a website for us. Even his daughter moved to the Big Island to help us with sales. In the meantime, I went to New York to hunt for fabric. I knew that I still wanted to continue creating my line, but doing it in such a whole couture way with all hand-painted items just wasn't feasible. Instead, I started thinking about ready-to-wear. While I was at Solstice, a French lace dealer, I met a young couple who had just inherited a mill from their family that was located in Lyon, France. It was a 13th century mill that had been brought up to the state of art and it had an incredible textile history. They told me that their primary business was making linings for jackets uh, for Chanel and Ralph Lauren. The couple invited me over to their little boutique office to show me some samples of other things that their mill produced. One of them was a nylon lycra that Chanel was using for their bathing suits. They said to me, we're willing to give you custom color. You select the print and you'll be the only one on the planet to have it. They also said that they would be willing to give me a very small volume, making it possible for me to consume their very special fabric. I started reinterpreting some of the patterns I had created with my seamstresses, and we came up with a few ideas that would work with this new fabric. The other benefit of this material was that it had a little stretch to it. My first collection using this ready-to-wear fabric was designing a knee-length spaghetti strap slip dress, as well as a mini-length. I also liked the idea of a midi-length tube skirt that had a strapless tube top that could be worn as separates. Completing that particular collection, I incorporated a full-length gown called a holoku, and with whatever scraps left over from this quite expensive fabric, I made bikinis. Just for fun, as an expression of my retro period in the 60s, I also included headbands.
wow, just to hear about those forays into fashion shows and getting your collections out there, did it feel after all the time to develop a collection and to learn the techniques of these people that you were studying, such as Madeleine Vianna um, and others that we've spoken about, did it feel like this was happening sort of really, really quickly where all of a sudden you were going out into the world with your designs? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I know. I had the experience of being on the Japanese bullet train, which yes. goes about 250 miles an hour. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it was really, yeah, maybe maybe like when I was, I think I was eight years old when I did a TV amateur show called Rocket to Stardom. Mm. And I didn't know where all of this was going to take me. But, you know, when opportunities come along, um, it's it's a real test to know mm. if you should say yes or no. And I wasn't alone on this. So, so it, you know, it was it was a decision that we both made together. And um, I would say that it's, you know, it's just all part of life. You know, sometimes you're catapulted. <laughs> out of a cannon, <laughs> you know, and you hope you land on your feet and just dust yourself off, you know, but I'm sure, um, you know, there were lots of interesting turns and bumps in the road and, but I wouldn't, I would never trade the experience. I mean, it was just, it was an amazing experience and kind of interesting that it ended up being with uh, someone from the Trump family, mm. although she wasn't, uh, she wasn't really, um, associated she was an ex-wife at the time and, and her daughter was you know a 17 year old girl who was um, very very sweet very kind and at the time was very humble and appreciative and mm-hmm. you know um, thanked me so much for giving her a, a dress and everything that went with it so you know um, what can I say it's mm-hmm. <laughs> just you, you just um uh, you just have, sometimes you just have to go with it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, that whole idea sometimes of, it's a psychological term, but it's called sitting with discomfort or sometimes realizing that things that are new and are different are potentially going to put you into discomfort, but that's not necessarily a reason not to do them. That discomfort is a normal a part of life and change. And as you said, we can make that decision to retreat or we can go into that unknown. And that's what you did and got to have quite a few experiences that started off what became, of course, your business. And I'm interested in doing these shows and being back out there. Did that feel quite strange? Because you had kind of led a a much more quieter existence um, leading up until this time, but in some of those events, such as the House of Blues, you would have been introduced at the um, at the end of the show. Did that feel strange? Did that feel um, retro? What? How? How was that? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I kind of felt like the matriarch um, because mm, you know yeah. I was first of all the clothing and all the accessories were like um, my children. Mm. And and the models were of, of my children's ages. Yes. And and I was taking care of them. Mm. And so to come out at the very end with uh, one of the models, uh, typically at the end of a fashion show, a bridal uh, outfit is shown, and um, and that's that's what I did, you know, as a conventional thing. And so, um, I you know I just escorted her out. So it was very, very different. It wasn't about me. Mm. It was just, you know, very, very different. It when I when I had to take the stage and sing and do whatever, it was, you know, it was all on me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, and and as you said, you know, things happen so um, I don't know, kind of uniquely or strangely, mm. but. Um, I mean, the same thing happened. I can draw a parallel to when I, you know, I was flown to Chicago 
in first class, walk the red carpet and sign to Dr. Pepper. And, you know, first time I meet Dick Clark, yeah. you shove a microphone in my mouth and, <laughs> and suddenly, uh, you know, I'm on television uh, co-hosting a, a show with him. Can I introduce you to a fellow I wanted you to meet? I'd love to meet anyone you, you want me to meet. All right, now, hold on a second. Paul, would you come here a second? You're kind of buried down there in the fireplace I'm here. I'm down on my pillow. Yeah. Do you real, how many years have you have you been doing the, uh, the uh, Donna Reed show? Six now. And it's still going on, full force? going on. <laughs> now, in, in the recording field, you know that the fellow makes a few records. Have you got a I current do. release? Yes, uh, cheerleader. What's it like? Wild and furious? Uh, no, it's kind of cute. What am I talking about? What's it like? I've heard it uh, <laughs> several thousand times. What is your, your biggest ambition, Paul? I think my biggest is to become a, a, a good actor, a good, uh, steady working actor. Oh, good luck in God's feet. Thank you so much for coming by. Donna, step over here a second. I want you to meet um, a gentleman that's been a friend of mine for a long time. Bobby, would you come here a second? I don't know whether you realize, but this particular house we are in right now was lived in by Frankie Avalon, Fabian, Laurence Olivier, um, Ann Baxter, John Hodiak, and this man's name is Bob Marcucci. Have you met Bob? Yes, I have. Hi, Bob. How pleasure. are you? My pleasure. He is the current resident. He is the manager of Frankie Avalon. Bob, thank you for letting us use your home. Pleasure having you here, all of you. It's really beautiful. It's great. It's perfect for us. Oh, steady. I'm going to put you to work in a little while. Right now, if we can take a half a second, I would like you to meet a young lady that's joined us many, many times in the past. Ladies and gentlemen, Annette. <laughs> I wasn't really, pre you know, prepared to do that either, but, but it flowed. And I, I think sometimes you just have to trust the situation and just go for it. That's interesting, isn't it? The, the parallel between those two uh, situations. You're right. Perhaps sometimes we're never fully prepared, albeit uh, in both situations, both in the fashion and in the earlier career, there was so much preparation. Um, in the, in the case of the career, it was very much preparing for this big moment of of signing something so big. And in the case of the fashion, it wasn't considered to be a business. It was more of a therapy and an exploration and and that sort of thing. But in both cases, yeah, it's sometimes you're given the opportunity and you take it and you go with it and and um, see where it goes. Yeah, and in I think one of our last episodes that mm -hmm. I, I I kind of jumped on, you know, the discussion about the bride that that I made a wedding dress for mm -hmm. and and her whole um, kind of transformation. So it was dealing with people on a different level, but, you know. But rather than uh, the focus being on me, it was all about someone else and what I could do for them. Mm -hmm. um, and what I could do for them was um, a creative endeavor. And, and that creative endeavor included collaborating with other people. And to tell you the truth, Adam, mm. that's, that's exactly how you and I became, you know, uh, collaborators mm. in the memoir and now on this podcast. That's very true. It's, it's all about collaboration, isn't it? And um yeah, I find that really interesting what you're talking about, that idea that it, it, it was a creative endeavor, but it was in the service of other people as well, whether it was this bride or people who required a wardrobe. It was really about working with them and, and working with your, your team to develop something in the service of, of what, they, what they needed. And certainly that whole conversation, anyone that's interested in fashion should really seek out Madeline VNA's work if, if they haven't seen it because as you said it was very influential even if at the time that she was designing she wasn't necessarily as well not that she wasn't recognized but I think she fell out of the radar a little bit yes. but the whole yeah her whole use of the bias cut and what that meant for gowns to be able to be free-flowing and people not to have to be cinched in with all the corsets and everything else is incredibly influential to this day. Yes, yeah, so that's for the modern woman. Um, I also wanted to um, kind of emphasize that, you know, as, a, as my career developed, uh, you know, many years ago, it was a family arrangement, business arrangement that really, I think I've explained, you know, I was put into a very responsible role beyond my, beyond my years, you mm -hmm. know, to take care of our family. And I know I'm not the only one. I know it's happened many, many times to young people. But um, I came out feeling very obligated 
to be responsible for, for my family. In this regard, you know, this was all my choice. Mm. It was it was a sense of freedom. And I had the support of, you know, my then, you know, um, co-creator, Jared, uh, before we were married. And there was just so much more um, freedom mm. in, to, if I made mistakes, I wasn't going to be, you know, condemned or, or it, it just was so entirely different. You know, uh, I wasn't being depended upon. Yes. Uh, although I took the responsibility of trying to do the best I could to please other people by learning how to make things for other people, not just mm-hmm. myself anymore. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It, it sounds like this was quite a different flip that, as you said, the career was born out of a lot of obligation. The stakes were, were uh, emphasized of if you didn't perform the way you could have what this would mean for other people um as i think we've mentioned before that doesn't always breed creativity although as you've you've said that when you were performing what could still shine through is that want to connect with an audience in spite of all the behind the curtain stuff that was going on that the public wouldn't have been aware of but again it, it it's not something that naturally lends itself to creativity when there's that that obligation that struggle um, the pressure all of those things the pressure and i do love that you brought up the word service mm. because you know i was of service to my family as a child and mm. a young person mm. but i know that i i love being in service to others mm. and it's just it feels so fulfilling to be in that role. So um, I'm really glad you you use that terminology. It is something that I think you you learn more and more as as you get older. That idea of in psychology they call it generativity, passing on your perspectives, your wisdom, and so on. But not even so much that. Just wanting, realizing perhaps that it doesn't always have to be about us. And that's that's a, that's a natural thing when you're growing up when you're coming out into the world you're, you're very focused on on yourself and and where you're going and what you're doing but that ability to step back and and just be open to other people's perspectives and experiences um i think is so important amazing i mean my time in hawaii mm. was so valuable you know it was like my life was being lived in 15 year increments <laughs> in, uh, seriously like a 15 year um, basically as a child. And then by the time I retired, that was 15 years. Mm. My first marriage was 15 years. And uh, and then an episode of void for 15 mm. years, another mm. one. And this <laughs> began another episode. So literally I spent, you know, a quarter of my life mm. in, in Hawaii um, after, you know, well, almost almost at the beginning, well, at the beginning of knowing uh, about this incredible lie that, that, um, you know, permeated my life. And, and boy, did I need that time to work through, you know, just getting, you know, getting like, letting the truth find its way throughout my entire being and realizing, you know, uh, more and more how to function in life. Um, with you know with the truth and um wow yeah (laughs) it was was a gentle experience i couldn't have asked for a more gentle place to deal with such a harsh reality Mm, mm, i think that's so apt that idea of being in this place where you could process and just the nature of where you were um allowed you to to do that and whether that was not so much coincidental because again you you made a choice to take a leap of faith and move and move with Jared and and start a new life but I wonder if women and I I don't want to put words into anyone's mouth but I wonder particularly I guess for anyone but particularly women whether they relate to this idea of the life in those different increments because I think as we've spoken about before I, I mean although yours was quite inverted that you started life with a career but people becoming wives and mothers and that being a period of their life and then when that kids grow up or situations change then they may move into another 
period of, of their of their life. I, I do wonder if anyone listening can relate to that and the changes that they made or the, the different things that happened growing up at a certain a certain time when every generation has these unique experiences. But um, women of your generation, what they did and um, becoming wives, becoming mothers, but also at that that dawn of the women's liberation movement. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a lot to unpack. Well, may I share an experience that I just had um, very recently, mm. which I think speaks to what you're saying. Mm. And I think that it's, it's under the topic of an evolution mm. Uh, mm. Uh, of how one starts their life and, and then may evolve. Mm. So I um, had an experience being in someone's energy that actually made me feel sick to my stomach. Right. And I literally was drained Mm. and it didn't, it was just a few moments of being in this person's uh, energy field, but, you know, I guess I was completely vulnerable to, you know, what, what she was kind of projecting. Mm. So I literally had to come home and, um, you know, get over this sick feeling. I was Mm. just like, it's just a Mm. terrible feeling. Mm. And so basically, I realized that she touched on how I operated in my youth. Right. When life was out of control and I felt, you know, every, all the decisions were being made for me. Yes. Yeah. That was the kind of toxic energy that she put out, you know, just. I, I can't explain it any more than that, but it affected me. And what it did is it took me out of who I am today and threw me all the way back to feeling helpless mm. as a very young person. Mm. And we always, you and I always talk about, you know, reflecting on the past in a present state of mind. Yes. Yeah. And I definitely assert my you know energy in doing that um to stay you know stay in the present well evidently there was a need for me to purge something Mm. that was in me and you know that was left over from the past and to be able to step back and observe it and you know and finally that sick feeling in my gut Mm. And even my heart was racing, you know, right. like, yeah. Yeah. all the feelings I used to have when people would, you know, in, especially in my career and in my family, people would tell me what to do, how to do it. Da, 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 da. Mm. And, you know, what can I say? I'm sure, again, I'm not the only one. I know that. I know there's to have a privileged life of uh, being able to express yourself from the get go is fab fantastic and maybe even fantastical (laughs) some some do experience that or some do seek that and find it um but it really opened me up to see how i have evolved absolutely that even though it did give you that physical visceral reaction and it did throw you back into some of those feelings or get you back in touch with those feelings you were able to recognize that as well so even though it did throw you for for a six, um, I think even in that moment, you could have that awareness and that understanding of what was occurring so that it, it didn't have to th- throw you back in there at, at, for a long period of time, perhaps. No, and, and it really was, I mean, it's very valid when you're talking about not just women, mm. you know, but everyone, you know, who has been wounded in their childhood. Mm. Mm-hmm. How, however, you know, you receive your wounds, it's painful to face them. And, you know, somehow, you know, my dear husband showed up and sat with me and told me, you know, I think this is a gift. Mm. You know, I know you're feeling uncomfortable now, but you you're recognizing what has happened. And I'm here to support you in in kind of understanding and getting through it and <laughs> he's he's not into 
probing or and he, he's actually <laughs> very um very good listener and mm-hmm. and is very kind of insightful to understand feelings and not yes. try to push your feelings when like somebody else mm. might say just get over it yeah you know yeah. <laughs> but then i know if somebody says to me or if anyone listening somebody says you know just get over it mm. well then that kind of forces you to push it back down yeah you're not getting over it you're just hiding it from that person so that you don't have to share it with them again and then it goes back in into like your deposit yeah. You know, you deposit it back into you, and um, and what I was doing was releasing it. Mm, yeah, I was releasing a wound from childhood. Yeah, that's. I think that speaks really importantly to a, a lot of the the things that we have spoken about. That idea that, um, yeah, pushing it down doesn't mean you've resolved it. It's just pushing it down. Um, You probably feel some shame associated with that if people dismiss it or say, why are you still going on about this or why are you thinking about that or or just get over it. But to acknowledge that discomfort, to acknowledge that upset, that reaction, um, to talk about it, to think about it can allow it to not have that space that it would have once had in your life, which I think is so important. Thank you, man. You really used another very significant word, and that is all that toxic energy is taking up valuable space. Mm. (laughs) Some people even call it real estate, you know, Mm. it's like taking up valuable real estate within you. And if you are given an opportunity to release it, yes, you're giving yourself more space to fill in with new and evolutionary, you know, creative, co-creative i you know uh, energy that is happening now otherwise there's it's you're just cluttered you know yeah yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's time and it's time for a deep spring cleaning you know <laughs> <laughs> i was just thinking that i think that's a great metaphor if anyone's got any mid-century antiques contact me i will take <laughs> them off your hands but um other than that clean clean your house but um, yeah, we, I, I know we're being a bit silly here, but it's so true that idea of even how the physical can reflect the internal that um, often we've, and I'm only thinking this because I've been watching a few of those selling houses type shows recently, but uh-huh. that idea that even people often have these really cluttered houses, these really disorganized houses, and that's as much a psychological thing as it is just a physical accumulation of stuff that sometimes our internal clutter can then be manifested into our lives, whether that's in our houses, in relationships, whatever. And so doing that internal work is is really important for uh, what is out there in our lives. And, you know, and to recognize, I think, to just recognize that who you were when you were wounded Mm. is not who you may be now. Mm. Mm. And, And that really helps your um, ability to observe it, it, it you know th- like in meditation you know to not be of it so mm. you can watch you can watch what occurred and see it for what it is but not like take that deep dive into the pain and suffering of it so that you but you recognize it identify it that's what I did a couple days ago. It was not fun. But, it, you know, today I'm, I feel much more centered. And I must say also that when you're talking about a person's evolution and, you know, what's been going on in the past century and what's been going on in the past millennium, and these times are really changing. Mm. And to go with it, you're not only clean your own house but it's like you start cleaning your internal being Mm. and then you are part of cleaning the planet because mm. you (laughs) Mm. it just takes each one of us it's so crazy maybe we said this before but everybody scratches their head and it's like what can i do what can i do you know what can i do about politics what can i do about 
the weather, the climate change, what can I do about blah, 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 all this stuff that's going on. And I think it starts with cleaning out your own house, mm. cleaning inside you first. Yeah, I think that's so true that then that radiates out to the relationships you have, the way you are out in the world, uh, what you want to do, what you want to accomplish, all of those things. And I think that idea of that being able to observe um, your reaction or the situation from this distance perspective is so important because certainly in psychology, there's been work done that even if you're having a, a problematic situation or there's something that's bothering you, Often what we do is we think about it in our heads and we replay it and we yep. almost put ourselves back in that moment of it. Yep. Um, there's actually some evidence showing that you can train yourself to sort of look at that situation almost as if you're a fly on the wall watching it unfold or almost like watching a play on stage. When you do that, when you distance yourself from it, you can often get that insight and that perspective. It's like, And you don't have to do it in that imagery. But when you can distance yourself and realise that you're not in that moment now, but also you have an ability within you to look at that. You're not that, I, I know we've said this before, that Eckhart Tolle idea of are you the voice inside your head no you're not you're you're some something else that can actually observe that you can observe yourself and reflect on that and that gives you that distance and that insight into what's going on rather than just replaying it replaying it and ruminating mm. on it I, and what about the emotion you know mm. it's the emotion that is kind of like the the goo or you know that <laughs> that gets that gets in there and kind of hooks you into that paralysis mm. and, you know, and that sick feeling uh, that just makes you dysfunctional. So to me, it's like really, for me, it works with another person, mm. someone who is either witnessing my emotion and they, they know that, hey, wait a minute, 15 minutes ago, you were in the kitchen and, and with a smile on your face mm. and, and now you, you know, you're a completely different person. So how to untrap yourself out of the emotion that keeps you locked into that old thought? Mm, mm. That and, is yeah. tough. It is incredibly tough because it does and it can take over. And almost, yeah, that ability again to, to recognize it, to recognize that it's uncomfortable, that I don't like it, but to understand that it is a reaction that you are having to something again you know th th these are big concepts that we're we're distilling but it takes work and it does take effort so that you can catch catch yourself when you are in these moments um in the future and try and look you know when you feel so bad mm. that you know and if you can have someone to talk to about it Yes. And, and be completely honest mm. about what is affecting you. If you can, it's uh, the honesty, the truth is what liberates that out of you, it seems like. If you, if you can't really identify it and recognize it, then it, has, it can go back and hide. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it, it, it's so uncomfortable. But, you know, the um, outcome is worth, it's kind of like, what do they say? No pain, no gain. Yeah. Whatever it is, whether it's sport, which I wouldn't know anything about just between you and me. <laughs> <laughs> what if, what I'm if, sure <laughs> you've been to the gym and I know, I I know if you're walking Lucy and she takes you on a good run. I do go it's... to the gym. Um, her, hers is more she likes. She likes a good run herself. But when we're walking, it's more about the meander. It's stop to talk to the people and to, <laughs> you know, which is quite pleasant. But um, yeah, I, I again and and what I what this kind of reminds me of and, and leading into our our next fan guest, the person that we're speaking to today, is I think many of us weren't always taught or perhaps encouraged to express emotion, to understand ourselves, to do some of that internal work. I, I know even when I was in university studying psychology, there was kind of this boundary put up between, well, you're studying psychology. It's not about you understanding yourself. It's about helping other people or seeing what they've got as they've got their problems or issues. But no, you're the supposed expert, which is completely wrong because everyone needs 
assistance sometimes. Everyone needs to understand themselves. Everyone needs help. But what I'm really happy, I guess, to see more and more with young people is that they have so much more awareness, I think, of themselves and who they are and uh, what they want to be and do. And, and I think they understand respectful boundaries much more. And so I'm kind of excited that over the next couple of episodes, we've got some young people who are talking to us about their lives and what they're doing. Yeah, the next generations. And with that in mind, our guest today is Sandy Netburn, who loves mid-century, but is in her teen years and also has her own podcast and has a range of talents. And we were really happy to speak with Sandy recently about what she does. Yes, her music, her life, her family Mm. support, the antithesis Mm. of my own experience. So welcome, Sandy. All right, let's see. Am I in tune here? Yeah, we're good. All righty. Right on. Fabulous. What a treat. Well, Love's a Secret Weapon community, please welcome to our podcast the multi-talented Sandy Netburn. Sandy, how are you today? Thank you for starting us off with a song. Uh, thank you for allowing me to. I'm, I'm great. How are you? We're doing well. <laughs> Donna, how are you? Oh, I, I'm thrilled to hear a young person at, with the kind of talent and um the, the kind of entrepreneurship that, that you seem to emanate. And I hear that you have your own little podcast. Is that true, Sandy? Yes, I do. It's called the Sandy and Friends Podcast, and I do it with puppets. <laughs> yes, I was going to say, who is, your, who is your co-host or co-host? Yes, so I have one mainly. Her name is Anna Lynn. Um, she's she kind of kind of a little sassy to our guests, so I got to be honest with you. <laughs> but she can get away with it, right? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, she's gorgeous. At least that's what she says. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell her to listen to Mary J. Blige's new song, I'm So Gorgeous. <laughs> oh, she'll really dig that. <laughs> Absolutely. And how long have you been uh, doing ventriloquism, Sandy? Gosh, it's been about five years now. Wow. wow. What, what brought that to your interest? Oh, it started a lot. I, it was, I was very young when I first became interested in it. My dad showed me Jeff Dunham when I was really little, mm. um, and I just became hooked on the idea of it. So um, then I, uh, I rediscovered him after a couple of years, and I just I had to do it. I had to try it out, and I became hooked on doing it. 
That's and amazing. So, did, did you have a special doll made for you, or did you find one that was already made? Oh, I found one that was already made. I was begging my parents for a puppet, so I, I started out with this little one that was legless. So, uh, but then I found one online, and I figured she looked just like me, so that was the one I got. <laughs> <laughs> and you, um, you Sandy, uh, as you said, you're, you've got your co-host on, on the podcast. Tell us uh, a little bit about how did... Well, let's start at the beginning. How did you become exposed to or become interested in, because you talked to a lot of people who worked in the 60s and the 70s, um, yes. how did you become interested in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and, and that music? Was that from your parents or was that somewhere else? Yes, it was from my parents. And I honestly had no idea that any of this um, was was out of the norm for someone my age. Um, it was just my, my parents always had music um, all around us constantly as we were all growing up. Um, and every night before we went to bed, my father would put on a TV and it was shows that he had watched when he was growing up or that he found when he was in his teens or as an adult. So um, I just really enjoyed it. I figured, you know, this is just, this is television this is music and uh, I just I loved it and then when I became hooked on music I realized my my place was in those decades I just love it so much <laughs> oh so you're an old soul so which which shows did you like oh man there's so many um I would have to say though um my favorites would have to be the Parker's family and the monkeys I mean the music man <laughs> <laughs> absolutely so it's the, it's those music shows and uh uh, I'm trying to remember as well. What did what did you like, Donna? Okay, well, I'm going to frame this mm. as though um, in my teen years and in your teen years, Adam, mm. and in your now present teen years, Sandy, <laughs> and how how what we all have as a common denominator and what our interests mm -hmm. are, and mm. see how timelessness and how classic you know, our interests are. Mm. So, you know, um, I grew up in the late 50s and 60s, and then I participated in uh, most of the up-and-coming British invasion and um, the music of the 60s. So I had a real hands-on experience of mm. meeting, you know, and working with um, everybody from Motown to... Um, you know, Philadelphia music to uh, the Beach Boys and um, and and the st the Stones and everybody from England that that came on to a show that I was on. Mm. So um, and also some concerts that that we did in the fifty in the five years of my career in the sixties that um, were more eclectic and covered a wide range of, of pop music. Now, here is your shindig host, Jimmy O'Neill. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, and welcome to Shindig. Boy, we got a jam-packed jet propel show full of music for you tonight. And here to kick it off is one of America's favorite young music personalities, Miss Donna Lauren. <laughs>
starting to fuse back then. Um, you know, country music wasn't so definitely country. Classical music wasn't so, cla- you know, definitely classic. Um, now it's really merged. And, um, and then, uh, Adam, you tell me what you watched. Well, well I, I was a bit like Sandy that even though I watched what was on at the, the time, I liked a lot of the classic shows. So it was things like Bewitched and I Dream of Jeannie. And oh, awesome. Smart. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, I just love them. And like you said, Sandy, I think they, a good show is a good show and is timeless. And, and for me, it was the, the furniture and the fashion and things like that. Are, are you attracted to the, the fashion of the 60s and 70s as well? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm always walking around with my corduroy and my bell bottoms. It doesn't make me the most popular at school, but it's fantastic for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am so glad that you are not trying to win a popularity contest. <laughs> just, the most important thing in life is to discover who you are and, and to express it 24-7. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite proud of you for, for being an individual and doing that. Oh, thank you so much. I just, uh, there's so much out there that I enjoy so much. And I feel so lucky to have found so much of this as a kid. I have so much time to explore it now. That's so true, isn't it? And also sounds like your, your parents have introduced you to it, a lot of this, but are quite supportive of of you taking an interest in in uh, this pop culture oh absolutely i have such fantastic parents they're they they invest in my bell bottoms <laughs> <laughs> and um sandy do you 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 played the guitar for us how long have you been doing that Gee, that's interesting. So um, I was plucking a little bit when I was about seven. And then, you know, um, I I didn't play as much until I was about 11. And that's when my dad said, do you know the song Stairway to Heaven? And I said, no, I don't. And then he played it for me for the first time. And I was in awe. And he said, I bet you could learn that. And I thought he was absolutely crazy. And I was like, you're crazy. And then uh, he said, sure, yeah, you're right. You can't do it, which made me have to be able to I had to learn it (laughs) he told me I couldn't um and uh after a few years of teaching myself um I'm I'm now taking lessons tremendous so you started with Jimmy Page okay (laughs) right I know it's insane (laughs) but there are so many groovy guitar players that you you know can mentor with and um and so who else do you listen to, like Eric Clapton and Jeff Beck and who else? You know, I've just been introduced to both Eric Clapton and Jeff Beck. Um, I also, I lo- I just found out also about Pete Townsend, who is mm. insane. He's unique in that, the way that he does his complete circumference with his shoulder. <laughs> I've never heard it put like that, but that is that is so accurate. <laughs> he's got a, he's got a loose what do you call that rotator cuff? <laughs> that is so funny. I usually, would suggest you he sees someone for that, but you can't argue with results. <laughs> no, you you just can't. Uh, <laughs> that's that's what I call a healthy addiction. You know. <laughs> oh, <that's so> funny. <laughs> and you Donna, have so mm. much music to discover. Mm. You, I mean, you have a. A, a plethora of um, culture, a, a cultural experience. It's kind of like you're you're in a time machine. Uh, yeah, you know what? I love that. Oh, I wish I had a time machine. Honestly, I would love to just uh, go back and absorb it all back then. But you mm. are in your own way, and what you're doing is linking a time frame to now and relating to it. Anybody else that that you hang out with, uh, associate with, or relate? Well, um, you know, the kids not so much, but my adult friends do. Uh, my parents for sure. <laughs> right, right. But I mean, just, just like, is there any crossover, you know, from the kids that you go to school with or, you know, associate with? And um, do they, ha- I'm not saying they have to uh, identify with it as closely as you do, but um like when they listen to Billie Eilish or, you know, or I don't know, you name it, um, in their era, what, is there, is, is there any way to kind of break that barrier and, you know, communicate your style with their style? Hmm, that's interesting. Well, you know, I found out when, when somebody really takes a hold on music, it doesn't really matter whether or not we have the same taste or the same interest, because it's, it's just so universal, that feeling of just 
gosh, what am I listening to? This is insane. Mm-hmm. It's it's so strong. So um, wow, anybody, I, I um, applaud you, I applaud you for that. Isn't that great, Doctor Adam? That's so true. That I uh, recently, my partner and I and some friends got back from a music festival and we camped out for two days. And anyone that knows me knows that that was uh, you know. Wait no... a minute, you didn't camp. <laughs> you had to glamp. Well, yes and no. I mean, I'd I'd bought a beautiful queen size. Uh, I thought air mattress so. <laughs> and the, the tent kind of had a foyer, Sandy. You know, it wasn't a it wasn't a little tent, but. <laughs> But, I um, I can never go mm. camp, so that's that's closer than I would ever get. <laughs> well, it was it had it was the best we could do, but we went to a, a festival. There it was such eclectic musicians, but again, like you were saying, is when you're connecting with music, when you feel this community with with people, whether it's listening to you know music on the radio or on you know whatever, or it's being out in person at a concert, or in this case. Um, everyone just felt connected and it didn't really matter that it wasn't, you know, one act might have not been the music that you were into um, because uh, you joined with people. It, it brought yeah. people together. It's so, you know, yeah. I think that's so true. Yeah, it's the vibration. And, and by the way, I'm going to get a little esoteric on you, but, um, you know, there is a new frequency that we're all kind of being um, subjected to with this um new energy that is, I don't know if you feel it, but it's coming in on a higher, higher frequency so that, you know, the relations relating to um, all forms of timetables, you know, and all forms of way that people have lived and, and um, especially going back to um, the tribalism in, in ancient times when, you know, there were, the sense of community that we have with our cell phones and our our devices were around a campfire and maybe a wooden stick that was hollowed out and somebody played a flute or added a string to it or danced or mm-hmm. sang or or you know d- did a rhythm or something and and it's it's that vibe you know that you're conveying to me that that it doesn't matter. Both of you are telling me the same thing. It doesn't really matter when you're together. And you, and music is the core of, of what you're doing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, once again, it's just something that is so universal. It's not just about uh, lyrics or even being able to read the music that you're playing. It's, there's, there's a feeling in it. I don't even know how to explain why that would be, but there's something just in there that I think everybody can relate to. Absolutely. And I think you're talking to the right person in Donna. You know, I'm just thinking, Donna, of your experiences recording, for example, with the Wrecking Crew and those, you know, brilliant musicians. Indeed, I've shared with you and in, in our community that, you know, when I used to walk into a studio, and I'll tell you, Sandy, you know, I used to walk into a studio that, with premier A-list you know, musicians, and literally my feet would not touch the ground. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like in a contained area with excellent engineers and excellent microphones and beautiful walls and just the right acoustics. And, you know, and then these musicians that come together and um, form a, a unit uh, that supported me and many others who, um, you know, you just 
you're lifted, literally lifted off the ground. And um, that, <laughs> that whole thing, you know, Sly Stone saying, you know, you got to take me higher. Well, it didn't take anything but the music to, to get me higher. <laughs> And it must have been wild. Is that what is that what music does for you, honey? Absolutely. Oh, I can't I can't get enough of being around my record player. It's just mm-hmm. so you play vinyl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and you have and your parents got you some good gear. Uh, yeah, actually, I just got a new player. I'm excited about it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so you've got your arm and the needle and carefully put it down so you can play it over and over and over again without scratching it (laughs) well you know what i have had some uh struggles with needles in my time so this this player is an automatic (laughs) oh you don't have to do anything you just press the button and away it goes yeah it's the future man (laughs) (laughs) oh well that's so interesting. Um, I'll share something with you because my my first husband was a record producer. And um, here's a song that you can look up from the 60s. It's called Feeling Groovy by the Harper's Bazaar. Oh, I know that song. My first husband produced that. And what he, you know, and I was with him for about 15 years. So I got a, a pretty good dose of the way that he listened to music. And he always had a turntable where he had to lift the arm and the way he'd uh he'd get a song you know or or, um an artist would present themselves to see if he wanted to produce them and he would lift the arm and he would put the needle down at the very beginning for about five seconds then he'd lift it up and put it in the middle put it down for a few seconds then he'd lift it up and put it at the end And he'd get about a total of 15 seconds to decide if he was going to work with that artist or that song. (laughs) Wow. That's pretty awesome. I I guess, I guess when someone like him, he just knows when he knows and also perhaps doesn't have the time to go across everything, but I'd never heard that story before. (laughs) Yes. I, I, I know he had the time. It's just, you know, hearing that, you know, what the frequency is that is delivering uh, the message of the song, the sound, um, the feeling you get, just like you're describing that, that you feel from the music that you're choosing. Slow down, you move too fast. You got to make the morning last. Just kicking down the cobblestones. Look at the fun and feeling groovy. And what a wide scope you're going from 60s to 70s to 80s. Yes, I am. I just, um, that's, that's what my parents have shown me. I mean, I've, I've gone outside of that. There's some cool stuff between the 50s and there's some stuff in the 90s I like. But um, I've really been attracted to, to rock and there's so much in rock. You know, you go from the Beatles to the Monkees to, you know, Led Zeppelin and it's all in the same genre. Mm. Okay, well, give it, get, just give me, um, like, just highlight 60s, like, maybe late 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, what, what you tune into. Oh, okay. All right. I'll give you my, my favorite ones. So, uh, like I just said before, the, um, the Beatles, the Monkees, that's, that's gigantic for me. I just absolutely love them. Um, like I also said, I love Led Zeppelin, um, Styx. Queen, Pink Floyd. Mm. Uh, uh, I love the Who. Uh, now I love the Who. I, I only I know I did, but now I do. Um, and Rush and the Kinks. Uh, there's so much. Gosh. Okay. Well, I'll give you another um, very personal point of view and um, let you know that one of my children, my son, who is a musician, is on tour with Roger Waters from Pink Floyd right now. Oh my gosh, that is so cool. <gasps> Yeah, yep. it's great, great. And he's been doing that for a while, hasn't he? I mean, it's been different stores. 
They're in Milan right now. Oh my gosh, I can't even imagine what that must be like. <laughs> yes, pretty, yes. pretty electric. Um, Joey was here in Adelaide in, oh, that was a few years ago now when they were doing the, I think the the first tour around with with Roger Waters and, and he sort of, you know, got us into the, I don't know, VIP room or whatever, but just seeing uh, him rock out on that stage um, yeah. alongside Roger Waters was pretty electric. Excellent. I- <laughs> Excellent. So tell me, Sandy, what concerts have you been to um, other than the festival that you were just saying? Oh, no, that that was you, Dr. Adam. That, that was you me. Just- yes, <laughs> that was me glamping or camping. <laughs> <laughs> so in New York, um, where do you go to listen to music uh, other than your bedroom on your uh, on your turntable? <laughs> I've I've actually and I'm so glad you're asking me this now and not a couple of years ago because I've only just started going to concerts. Yeah, <laughs> and- uh, okay. Um, so my first one was I actually saw a Van Halen tribute. It's actually pretty fantastic. They're called Romeo Delight. That was my very first concert. Um, okay. Absolutely fantastic. Then so also, Eddie Van Halen, did, did they do a good job for Eddie Van Halen? Oh, they were, yeah, they were fantastic, especially the guitars. In, insane. They were just great. I really enjoyed it. Oh, um, so a couple months after that, I got to see the monkeys on their farewell tour. So that was a thrill. Wow, amazing. So that's yeah. Mike, that's Mickey and Peter and Michael? Um, at the time, it was uh, Mickey and Michael, but um, that, was, that was the last book. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's, you're very fortunate. And I hear that, that you have spoken to Mickey? Yes, I got. I've had uh, the opportunity to meet him a couple times now. It was absolutely wild. He is the greatest guy. Donnie, yeah, you'd uh, agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that he was totally underrated in in the '60s, um, and he's proven otherwise. To you know, throughout the years, to uh, be able to perform and um, I mean, I'm a believer is one of my favorite songs. Anyway, so uh, do you like that song? Yes. Oh, that's one of my favorites, too. He's got such yeah. a fantastic voice. He does. It's amazing. And g- really good energy. Yeah. Even on the stage now, he's running around. He's great. I just I love watching him. He's such a performer. He's like an energizer bunny. He just doesn't quit. <laughs> really, it's, it's in him. I love it. He has Um, and so, okay, you have these beautiful interests that are your extracurricular, right, at this time. And um, in school, uh, what are you studying just to give us a full spectrum of who Sandy is? Oh, uh, you know, the, the basics, you know, algebra, uh, chemistry, stuff like that. <laughs> and and w- do you write songs? I actually just started writing. Um, I didn't even know that I was interested in it until one day I was sitting in study hall and I was like, you know, I, I have a good idea and I bet I can make it rhyme and I bet it would make a good poem. And then I went home and I thought, I bet this would make an even better song. So I'm still working on it, but um, uh, it's oh. pretty cool. Oh, that's great. And given you said when you said algebra and chemistry, you didn't really say it with joy. Is, is, <laughs> I presume that's not where you're thinking of going in the future? Well, it's it's not that I don't enjoy it. I, I anything that I can learn, I love learning. Um, but uh, my my favorite place to be is either with the puppets or behind a guitar. I just art is I, all I've ever done. Well, so, you're a creative spirit, honey. And anything that is in 
I'm going to just say 3D or the mundane or, you know, more intellectual, you probably will find a way of incorporating it into your creativity. Is, is music or, or, or uh, performance something that you're thinking you might like to do into the future? Oh, definitely. Um, I've, I wasn't performing for a long while. It was only over, was it last? I think it was last summer <laughs> that I uh, had my first performance with a guitar out in front of people. It was so weird. <laughs> Well, Tell you're... me what kind of a guitar do you have? Oh, okay. So I have three of them. You want to hear about it? Yes. <laughs> okay. My my acoustic is a Yamaha. His name is Brian. Hey, I love Brian. <laughs> yeah, he's he's great. I love him. Um, and then I have an electric. He's a he's a hollow body. He's an Ibanez, and his name is Mike. Hello, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> he he says hello too. And I have an acoustic twelve string, which I only got recently, that I'm totally in love with. And his name is Tommy. And what is he? He's a Fender, I think. He's a Fender. Ooh, wow! What a great family you, <laughs> that you've inherited and <laughs> adopted. <laughs> Fantastic, and, and um, you know, you performed for us. Um, you know, that's I, I find that just tr- tremendous and really brave to just do it on the spot. But on your podcast as well, you've played for some of your guests. Tell us um, who some of your guests have been. Yes. Okay. All right. This is so exciting. Um. So I've had Air Supply, both both members, Russell Hitchcock and Bram Russell, and I also had the guitarist on very recently, Aaron McLean, and that mm. was awesome. That's um, great. I, I had Chris Knight, who was Peter Brady on the Brady Bunch. <laughs> yes. John Most, who was Ralph Mouth on Happy Days, but he's also doing a lot more. I actually just did a second one with him recently. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, and we talked about his. Where did, uh, his where did you make these contacts? I mean, did did you ha, do you have an agent? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. Um, I've just been very lucky that there are some really generous people out there that are willing uh, to give me their time. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. Well, honey, you know, I mean, the internet and our, you know, Facebook and all of our media really connects us. You know, it's like, wow, we can we can be together. I can be in Arizona. Adel, you know, Adam is in Adelaide, Australia. You're in New York. What part of New York are you in? Long Island. All right. <laughs> so, you know, here we are and you just reach out and you get a response. Uh, so, sometimes sometimes I don't get a response at all but um you know I just I love being able to just give it a shot I know that sounds kind of silly but uh anytime I'm able to just go out and try something do it um that that's that's a thrill uh getting to have a chance at trying to reach out to these people um when when my parents were kids they without the internet they probably wouldn't have uh you know they would have had to have sent letters and it would have been a lot more complicated so I'm very fortunate to have these resources. Yeah, that's have so you, true. Have you always had this confidence? Uh, um, I I don't know. I I guess I never really thought about it. <laughs> um, I just I guess I just go out and I do what I love. I I love it so much. I just I got to try it. Well, you really you you just put you 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 put our love's a secret weapon um, ideology to you know to the master quality because oh. <laughs> well doing what you love to do is the secret of of happiness and joy and i'm so pleased and dr adam i'm so pleased that you know if literally on this planet where there's so much chaos and change going on mm. that when you a young woman 15 years old who can understand herself and um and stay focused on what you love to do and i hear your energy and it's contagious and and, you know and seriously you know you can be a pioneer and a crusader to create a new world you know to help filter out the chaos and conflict that you know, I lived through for most of my life and we're still going through it. Adam, you've gone through it most of your life. Mm. And, 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 you know, literally you were born into it, dear Sandy, you know, but now, you know, with your effort and Dr. Adam's effort and mine and our focus, and hopefully the, our listeners will all just, you know, do the, what do you call that dance when you, you know, when you, um, 
when you hold on to each other and you just keep moving. And, you know, <laughs> oh. I, I, I know it's not the zonk, is it? That's yours, Donna. That's yours. Oh, no, um. not the zonk. No, but we can zonk it out. We can zonk it out. You know? I think, yeah, that's that's so true what you're saying, uh, Donna. And we've asked, you know, Sandy, we've asked you uh, many questions and, and we usually like to give our guests the opportunity to ask Donna some questions. So if you do have anything that you're burning to know, please, the floor is yours. Oh, the floor is my, I'm, I'm excited about this. I have to know. So I, I remember what sparked it for me when I first wanted to start a podcast. Uh, but I got to know what started it for you. What made you want to start a podcast? Mm. Okay, well, it was a collaboration, really, honey, um, because uh, Dr. Adam and I uh, had been collaborating on my autobiography for several years. And, um, and then when uh, the world stopped, you know, um, I suggested to him, you know, rather than uh, going for a, you know, taking the manuscript and going for publication in, in print, let's do a reading um, uh, as episodes for a podcast and invite guests and we can, we can talk things over. And so that's how it began. I'm already up to chapter 20 mm. of my autobiography. And, and, and many, many, many people have joined us to have lovely and lively discussions and <laughs> share their lives Absolutely. with us. And we're sharing our lives with them. Because I think, um, Sandy, what what we've sort of you know you you mentioned that idea of now it's it's so much easier to contact people that you're interested in and you're passionate about, and I think the podcast in a way continues what Donna had always done, even in the '60s when she was working for Dr Pepper, that she had this unique ability because she did so many personal appearances to actually do that thing that many other um, people of that time or celebrities of that time couldn't and actually connect one-to-one -one with people. Um, is that, Donna, does that kind of... Uh, yeah, and when that? you're saying that, you know, in parallel, you know, Sandy, when you really get into the history of the 60s, you know, with the civil rights movement, um, a, a great deal of the time that I traveled was in the South. And, you know, my life was paralleling you know, the struggle of, um, you know, segregation. And, um, you know, and I saw it with my own eyes and I experienced it, you know, when I was a teenager, you know, seeing kids or adults, you know, in the midst of that, especially in the South part of this country and even in the Midwest part of this country. And it's a dilemma that, you know, is still um, very present in our lives. But, there has been a great deal of advance, although, you know, when I think about uh, Martin Luther King or, you know, just the, the great heroes of that time, Rosa Parks, you know, I had an, I don't know, but I was just given kind of like an angel on my shoulder to be able to have this, this uh, safe place to express myself and be with a, a, a cross section of people, um, not just young people, but all people um, to uh, to come together in in a time of tremendous conflict. And um, mm. what one thing I'll I'll just bring to your attention. Do do you ever listen to um, the Supremes music? I don't think I have. Okay, well I'll turn you on to it. Their first hit <laughs> was "Where Did Our Love Go," and um, it starts out, "Baby, baby." Where did our love go? Ooh. Like that. It's very Motown. And their second hit was Baby Love. And I was on tour with them before their songs became successful. Mm -hmm. So we're traveling through the South and um, in a mixed, mixed group where, you know, I'm a little white girl from Los Angeles and there's mixed, you know, they're the black girls from Detroit etc. And there was a whole group of us that were all mixed. And, um, you know, and we'd drive into a, a city like St. Louis. And, um, and we were already booked in a major theater. Well, <laughs> we get to the theater, and they make us walk through the back entrance through the kitchen, not through the regular entrance, 
Um, so that was one experience of not allowing, you know, blacks and whites through the same door, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. that was one experience. Um, there were many like that in, in my day, but, you know, we're still like, that's why I'm saying, you know, you can be, you can be a pioneer and a, and a crusader um, and a visionary, you know, to, to create a, a course, you know, of action in, in your energy field and, you know, keep attracting more like-minded and multiply to create a world that you want to live in and that, you know, you join together with a lot of other people. It doesn't matter who just, you know, the more, the more we are, the, the more we can manifest the a reality of, of the joy and the love that I hear coming from you. Oh gosh, thanks. Um, I think I think that's a great idea, and I think the way we should all do it is through music, because I think that's, that's the way we speak to one another. That's the way we feel that people are feeling. Absolutely, <laughs> through music, through um, actually any art form. Yeah. Any, yeah. any art form, and then I'm just going to add one more dimension to this because. We're entering a, a time zone of co-creation. And by that, I mean, when you look up and you see the heavens and you see the stars and the galaxy, and it's just endless, it's infinite. You, you, you know, just little old you, just little old me, <laughs> just takes <laughs> our love and our creativity and we co-create with that massive amount of energy that surrounds us in the universes and and that and co-create with that kind of majestic energy and just keep marching forward mm, that's so true it's uh, I love that. yeah just um I'm, I'm reminded just thinking of you know the first time I went to university and it seemed like the world just opened up because I met all these you know people I could find more like-minded people um diverse diversity of experience and and just be open to That's that new right. experience yeah it's all That's about right. that i think that openness yeah yeah when your heart opens you know the, the <laughs> you you become part of the rainbow coalition you know? <laughs> That's so true. And Gee, I, I'm just a little bit in awe of this whole conversation at the moment. I feel like I've, I've found my people here. <laughs> well, you know what, honey? As you say, ah, and I know you're spelling it A-W-E. Yes. <laughs> but, but what I, I just now hear somebody from the, that time period, but he's a philosopher. And um, th it's a man named Adam. You probably uh, know Joseph Campbell. Yes. Yes. Okay. And and I may I introduce Joseph Campbell to you, Sandy? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So he said something so amazing that I had to write it down. And I'm so happy to share it with you. Okay. He says, anyone who has an experience of mystery at all knows that there is a dimension of the universe that is not which is available to his senses. In other words, your uh, sight, sound, smell, right. touch. Mm. In the, um, so he's, he, there's a, it's called the Upanishads, which is an Eastern Indian uh, philosophy. He says, when before a sunset or a mountain and the beauty of this or that, you pause and say, ah, oh, that is participation in divinity. Oh, wow. I could see why you wrote that down. Gosh. <laughs> so can you imagine every moment of your life being in awe? That would be great. <laughs> That's as simple as it is to connect with the galaxies. That's great. That's uh, in psychology. There's a concept. I think it's called aesthetic chills or aesthetic thrills. It's it's Ooh. kind of you know when you're you're out in the environment, you're by a beach, or you're listening to music, or you're part of something with people, and you you just get that sort of you know that chill that that um, yeah. yeah that's uh, I, that almost speaks to that. I think um, I know that's kind of an electric current that connects you. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. You can't see it, but you can feel it. 
<laughs> I remember um, uh, I was I was speaking to Donna before we came on, Sandy, and I I went to a memorial for a, a person I knew who was an actor who who lived a very long long life, and it was quite a celebration of his life. But I I sort of dug out of something he told me that I think it was when he. Uh, was uh, seeing a play with um, Laurence Olivier appearing. So, you know, tremendous back in the 1950s. And uh, he was in, he was standing up in the theatre because um, you used to be at a, or you probably still can get um, a cheap ticket if you stand, <laughs> um, you know, rather than getting a, getting a seat in the theatre. And he saw this performance and he, he basically, the he got, you know, the back of his neck, you know, the, he kind of got that um, that feeling you get when mm-hmm. when uh, um, you know the, the hair the raises on the back of your neck. Absolutely, that's what I'm trying to say. And that's <laughs> then and there he decided, "This is for me. I am an actor." And that was that <gasps> that experience. Oh. And you know Regina Spector, the singer. Oh, th- this this is another one. Have you, Su- Sandy? Have you heard of Regina Spector? I don't believe I have. Okay, she is. Um, she's been around for more than a decade but she's Mm. you know she's current um she had she had some very popular songs on the radio and so forth and hit the charts Mm. um she is originally from russia and is um a very prolific songwriter and kind of surrealistic she's very very avant-garde and she plays a phenomenal piano she probably learned classical piano in russia then she came to the united states but um, she, Adam, she had an album called Cheap Seats. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and and that's another artist that my son Joey recorded with. So, the, just just a side note. Woo! Today we're younger than we ever gonna be. Stop, stop, what's the hurry? Come on, baby, don't you worry. Yeah, this That's is awesome. this is great. Uh, we're we're hopefully, or Donna's hopefully, turning you on to some some new things, just as you've sort of reminded us, Sandy, and our listeners to go and revisit some of those bands and and performance that you've spoken about. Oh, definitely, and you know, and it, it's amazing because there's a new guitarist that maybe you've heard of. His name is Billy Strings, and uh, <laughs> That's great. yeah, and he uh, he's a virtuoso at guitar and. Um, uh, he's well. I won't get into the whole history. It's so what you you know the what you're very into is what truly is happening with artists that are becoming so successful in utilizing you know tapping into the history, bringing it forward, and then using that to you know co-create with it and make it their own. And um, some of the music like he does he does you know old rock you know, traditional rock. And then he goes into um, all forms of music, but then he mm-hmm. goes into his original material and, um, and, you know, he speaks, he speaks to the language of what is being used now. So there's no divide at all, but um, he comes from when there was so much division and he's, he's bringing, he's bringing people together that wouldn't normally, you know, do that, which mm-hmm. is, so cool maybe that's something you can do too oh yeah i think that's so cool so i think it's just so exciting for all the all the things that you're finding time to do sandy and all the um you know the cool people you get to speak with and and just that love of the music and the fashion and the vinyl Um, how big's your vinyl collection well i only started it recently but so far i I don't know how to exactly describe it but i guess two shelves worth (laughs) oh wow (laughs) Yeah, we're about the same. I think um, uh, we started collecting a few years ago, but don't do it too often because it is a it it has been a bit of an expensive experience. And I'm trying to look at exactly uh-huh. what I can see. Tame Impala, which is an Australian um, oh yeah Australian musicians, and I can see the Three Degrees, which is a 1970s um, girl group, I guess. So uh, yeah, a bit of a gamut there. But um, do you do you collect uh, vintage vinyl or or do you go for the new new newly released vinyl? 
Oh, anything that I can hear it on. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> all, all these things are accidentally vintage. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, you have you have um, many, many, many opportunities, you know, over the 20th century and now in the 21st century to tap into. And um, I, I just I just will look forward to seeing who you blossom into, honey. Oh, gosh, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> thank you for your time, darling. And and all the best wishes from Dr. Adam and I for great success in your personal life, in your musical life, and lots of love to your family for all the support and love they give to you. Oh, gosh, oh, they're, they're great, aren't they? <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for having me on here. I'm so thrilled I got to talk with you guys. Well, big hugs. I'm reaching my arms out like the Incredibles. Oh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Sandy. That was an absolute pleasure. So much fun. Oh, I agree. Thank you. Take good care and stay focused and keep doing what you're doing, honey. Oh, gosh. I, I will. I, I love it. Thank you, guys. Love to you, honey. Oh, love back at you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, love.
Yes, sir. 